And stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of The Light of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. 30 seconds until hour number one from Mark. That was our final verbal time check for The Light of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. We'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before, followed by a short one at five seconds. Have a great afternoon, everybody. You gotta be kidding me. Math is racist? Grammar is racist? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Friends, we're going to have an awesome broadcast today eye-opening as well as edifying 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. This is Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the line of fire. All right. Uh, I expose error because I love truth. I will give warnings not to be controversial, not so people will say, oh, you told us so, but because I get concerned about issues in the world around us and want to sound the alarm. And friends, in contrast with many, many other talk radio shows that are primarily politically based or ideologically based or sociologically based, we are primarily biblically based. And everything we do flows out of Scripture, flows out of putting Jesus first. And then from there, we talk about relevant issues of the day. So we're going to get into this discussion about grammar and math being called racist. Yeah. Have you ever heard of feminist geography, by the way? A related subject. We'll talk about that. Then the bottom of the hour, I'm going to bring on my guest, Tom Gilson. He excuse me, has an amazing new book about the character of Jesus, Too Good to Be False. So we're going to have an interesting, edifying talk with Tom starting at the bottom of the hour. All right. I have been, like a brokered record, shouting out that the BLM movement is not really about black lives that the BLM movement is not something that you as followers of Jesus and lovers of the word want to be part of, that we stand together in proclaiming that black lives do matter. We stand together in exposing racism where it exists, injustice where it exists. We stand together as a body, as a family, in dealing with those things. At the same time, we see what's behind much of the BLM movement. We see where it's going. We see the spirit of anarchy and lawlessness. We see the other groups like Antifa and these others coming in with their own lawlessness and rioting and looting and vandalizing. And at the beginning, there were people trying to justify some of the looting and vandalizing and say, look, there's a built up frustration and pain and it's bursting. I understand. But when you're breaking into some, I don't know, Target store and carrying out a big screen TV, that's not because of George Floyd. Okay, that's that's looting. That's vandalism. That's lawlessness. That's greed. Well. Chicago ravaged now with destruction, police injured. And some of these police, you know, police chiefs are black, by the way. All right. They're taking their lives in their hands to stop the the looting and the vandalizing. Millions of dollars in damage. Well, listen to this. This is BLM leader Ariel Atkins, NBC News. Listen to what she has to say about the looting that just took place. I don't care. If somebody decides to loot a Gucci or a Macy's or a Nike, because that makes sure that that person eats. That makes sure that that person has clothes. That is reparation. Anything they want to take, take it, because these businesses have insurance. This is the social madness. This is the spirit of lawlessness and anarchy that we have been addressing. This is a local BLM leader. Let me urge you again, separate from that movement. And let the body of Christ come together and let other people of conscience come together and let us address issues where they need to be addressed. And when it's not a matter of systemic racism, but just a history of things that we're trying to fix where things are wrong or school issues or education issues. And how can we address them together? Let's address them together, but separate from this garbage. Now, I want to contrast that voice of that woman 
with several black voices, all black leaders, all respected in their communities. Some strongly liberal Democrats, could be all of them for all I know, but at least two strong liberal Democrats. Let's first listen to the Chicago uh, superintendent of police, Superintendent Brown, no relationship. Listen to what he has to say about the looting, the vandalism that took place. Friday through Sunday, 6 p.m. to 11.59, there were 31 shootings throughout the city, three of which were murders. These shooting incidents and the looting we saw overnight are completely unacceptable. Criminals took to the streets with confidence that there would be no consequences for their actions. And I, for one, refuse to allow these cowardly acts to hold our city hostage. Yeah, that is a black police superintendent. That is a black voice. That is a black life calling this what it is elsewhere. He said it is it is pure criminality. Then you got some BLM leaders saying, go ahead and loot. Go ahead. This way you got something to eat. <clears throat> oh, yeah, right. Sure. And you're looting because you want something to eat. I guess you're going to then t- take the stuff and sell it on the street for food. Right. Sure. That's why you're getting Gucci. Of course. Obviously. Stealing from a store like that. And they got insurance. What, what kind of madness is being cultivated and encouraged? Here you have a black police chief superintendent saying, not on our watch. This is criminality. What about the Democratic mayor of Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot, another black voice? What does she have to say about the looting and the vandalism? These individuals engaged when it can only be described as brazen and extensive criminal looting and destruction. And to be clear, this had nothing to do with legitimate, protected First Amendment um, expression. To those who engaged in this criminal behavior, let's be clear. We are coming for you. Oh, yeah. Criminal behavior. Criminal behavior. We are coming for you. Go ahead and loot. Take what you want. You need to eat. It's reparations. It's not reparations. It has nothing to do with reparations. There's nothing righteous, good, godly, honest, just about any of that. Zero. So, of course, the black superintendent of police, the black mayor are speaking truth in this situation. And these are also black lives and also black voices. Here's a conversation from Detroit. This is on Fox News, and this is Detroit Police Chief Craig, who's also black. I'm identifying these individuals as black so that no one could possibly throw this into a narrative of some type of white supremacy against the poor black looters. No, and look, in city after city, plenty of the vandalism is done by white thugs. It's got nothing to do with black lives. It's got nothing to do with justice whatsoever. And now the police chief of Seattle is is not that a a black woman. She's resigned because of the defunding of the police and the cutting back on job powers. Oh, yeah. And what's that going to lead to? Blacks getting killed and and people in the inner city getting killed and poor people getting killed and gangs running rampant. That this is this is why we have been shouting for weeks and weeks and weeks separate from the spirit of the BLM movement separate from what is happening and what they are pushing and let us work together to address real issues that are there. Listen to what Police Chief Craig had to say. One of the things that we saw here in Detroit, almost eerily similar to what happened last night in Chicago, a false narrative was perpetrated by these criminals very quickly and indicated that a unarmed teen was shot and then called for people to come downtown loot. Uh, Right now, they're protesting first and asking questions later. And all of this is fueling, as you and I have discussed many times, these defunding efforts going on in one city after another, police departments. Yeah, exactly. And, And by the way, many of the protests were based on falsehoods. For example, the Ferguson narrative, hands up, don't shoot. It's false. It's false. Okay. And, and then what happens is people who know the real facts, they're people who know the truth, then they, they get blackballed and you can't speak to this, you can't address this. And my contention is that the more you build movements on lies, the more you build movements on false narratives, the moment someone can explode that false narrative, then they can explode the whole movement, even if there's much truth, even if they're real issues. I think we all agree 
I, I would think very, very few Americans would disagree with the notion that there is police brutality, that, that police sometimes go too far. We'd have very different views of how often that happens, but we'd agree, yeah, difficult job and, and often taking their own lives in, in, in their hands, and we can't relate to what a lot of the dangers and issues that they face and deal with, but certainly you got bad apples and certainly there's police brutality. So we all agree, let's deal with that, but then you have the false narrative, you have the hands up, don't shoot, that did not happen, that three separate investigations, two of which were really looking for evidence that happened, none could find that that actually happened. People could then dismiss the whole police brutality narrative. They can dismiss the whole narrative. I say, well, that never happened there. Okay, so let's get rid of the lies. Just like when I do a debate, if I have a choice between giving you five irrefutable points and five points that are strong, uh, so 10 points total, it's wiser that I just major on the five irrefutable ones because otherwise, if I've got a skilled debating opponent, what that person will do is they'll just pick the other five off because they're not as str- they're strong, but they're not as strong. They'll pick those off and therefore make it look like the others don't exist. So let's not give anybody an excuse for dealing with the truth. Let's put truthful narratives out there. Recent riots with Chicago allegedly shooting for no good reason. Well, it turns out that there was a man who had been arrested four times, including endangering a child, shooting at police. They returned fire. He was shot and hospitalized, expected to live. But it was based on false narratives, another police shooting, unjustified, the riots, the looting. Here, can you name for me a more prominent black voice that is associated with the liberal democratic movement that has been widely respected in many circles for many, many years as a civil rights leader? Can you name a voice that would be louder than Jesse Jackson? All right. Obviously, he has his critics. Okay. And I'm not a fan of his politics, but certainly prominent voice here. Look at what Jesse Jackson tweeted. Jesse Jackson about the riots. He said, this act of pillaging, robbing, and looting in Chicago was humiliating, embarrassing, and morally wrong. It must not be associated with our quest for social justice and equality. Dr. King, Medgar Everett, John Lewis, our martyrs cried together in shame, stop the violence, save the children. All right, now, obviously, words social justice that has a certain meaning and agenda with it. So he's being who he is. But my point is for Reverend Jesse Jackson to say this is embarrassing, this is humiliating, to call it pillaging, he's exactly right. Friends, there is a dangerous spirit, a spirit of anarchy, lawlessness, rebellion. As we've argued, there is a Jezebelic spirit behind much of this. It is destructive. And soon enough, it will turn on you as a follower of Jesus. So let's get on with the matter of justice. Let's get on with the matter of having helpful conversations and learning from each other. Let's get on with the matter of dealing with issues where they exist. And let's do away with this nonsense that looting is reparation. Nonsense. So how did the fall affect humanity? Well, profoundly, deeply, in every way. We went from fellowship with God to separation from God. We went from spiritual life to spiritual death. We went from the potential of living forever to now having bodies that will decay and die. We went from trust to fear. It goes on and on. Everything negative that we see in the human race today murder and rape and war, everything that we see in terms of people butchering each other, in in terms of hatred, in terms of bitterness, in terms of lust, in terms of greed, in terms of every wrong thing that's in the human race, all of that happened because of the fall. Look at what Paul wrote, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, he says this, therefore, Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. So every human being is born with a death sentence hanging over them. Every human human being is born fallen, meaning that it is our nature to sin. Every human being is born as an object of wrath 
uh, ultimately, this is what we grow up to and become because this is in our very nature. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to lie, to disobey. This is part of our fallen human nature. So physical death is an outgrowth of it. Sickness, pain, disease, what we have in this world, all the sin of the world, and then spiritual separation from God, being in a spiritually dead state. That's what happened because of the fall. The good news is through the one man, Jesus, we can be forgiven, receive eternal life, and have more through Jesus on the other side of the cross than Adam and Eve had before the fall. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I'm not making this up. I looked into these stories. I dug. I found primary source quotes. In other words, out of the horse's mouth, not someone said, someone said. Not a headline misreporting, not a misleading article, but actual tweets, text, statements, from professors, from university websites that support the idea that math is inherently racist, that grammar is inherently racist. Yeah, proper grammar. For example, for example, you grew up in a certain part of America, the education you received, the way you learned to speak was not in harmony with the way People were learning in most of the rest of the country. So you learn with improper grammar because of your environment. The school system didn't really support you. Now you are able to make it into college. But now in college, you will be penalized for improper grammar, improper word usage. And therefore, that is a racist construct. Instead, you should be graded based on your, your effort, not grammar if it's an English writing assignment. Math, to say two plus two is four, is also racist. I, I've written an article on this. Grammar is racist. Math is racist. And so are you. And again, I address these things because they make a mockery of dealing with real issues of racism. They, they make a mockery in, in, in looking at any lingering effects from our past history in America. They make a mockery of that. And they allow people to just scorn the whole subject. And when I say math is racist, grammar is racist, so are you. If you dare question it, then that proves you are racist. Oh, oh yeah. <clears throat> okay. So last month, there was a story got a lot of circulation. Rutgers University declared grammar to be racist. It was one professor had made certain statements. The professor said she was misunderstood. Fact checkers have challenged that. Different fact checkers have, have challenged that. So let's step back from that. But February 21st, 2017, Uni of, University of Washington produced an anti-racist poster which insists American grammar is racist and an unjust language structure promising to prioritize rhetoric over grammatical correctness. So if you really say the thing with passion, even if it's grammatically full of error, then you going to get good English grades for that. As explained on the university's Tacoma-based website, racism is the normal condition of things. Linguistic and writing research has shown clearly for many decades that there is no inherent standard of English. Language is constantly changing. These two facts make it very difficult to justify placing people in hierarchies or restricting opportunities and privileges because of the way people communicate in particular versions of English. So here's the point. English is not standardized across the country. For example, in the South, you could use the expression, I'm fixing to do this. But in New York, if you're fixing, you've got a tool in your hand. You're fixing something. There, there are expressions that we use. There are words we use. Words then get picked up. Urban vocabulary gets picked up. The word woke got picked up by the mainstream, things like that. So there's no standard. And, and therefore, to subject people to that standard, now they, they get into a higher educational setting, that's, that's racist. Because obviously, it's, it's the white grammar, the predominant grammar, the elite grammar, 
that that's considered proper English. Now, what's interesting is that statement used proper English. That statement was grammatically correct. That statement used capitalization. That statement put periods where they belonged. That statement used conjunctions and prepositions and nouns and verbs properly. Because there are basic rules. There are basic rules. And if you don't communicate using those basic rules, you will be misunderstood. And if you're in college to learn certain skills to equip you for the workplace, to equip you for a career, then you have to learn to use words properly. That's not racist. You say, but it's unfair because a lot of kids growing up in the inner city don't have good educational opportunities. They've got a few strikes against them. That's a big question. That's a massive question. That's a giant issue. And do we need to make school vouchers possible for them so they can go to other schools? And what can we do together as a country to help address some of these real issues? The, the whole purpose, though, of education then is, is to correct the errors and fill in the truth and give right, helpful information. <clears throat> uh, okay, let's go further. Uh, Professor Walter Williams, The Daily Signal, September 11th, 2019, wrote this. Just when we thought colleges could not spout linear ideas, we have a new one from American University. They hired a professor to teach other professors to grade students based on their labor rather than their writing ability. So the newly hired professor, Asao B. Inoue, who interestingly enough has also served as a professor at the aforementioned University of Washington in Tacoma, uh, he's the new prof there. Williams noted that Inoue believes that a person's writing ability should not be assessed in order to promote anti-racist objectives. And then we taught American University's faculty members that their previous practices of grading writing promoted white language supremacy. Friends, this is utterly ridiculous. I, I do understand the issue that is being raised. You know, for example, standardized tests have been used, SATs, PSATs, for decades. And Wherever you are in the country, as far as I know, everybody takes the same test. Well, there are kids who grew up in the inner city many, many years ago, decades ago, I saw this, and used certain vocabulary certain ways. And when they would get to these tests, they would do really poorly on them. And then to illustrate the point, kids that grew up, say, white kids in suburbia, they were given a test in language that would be more appropriate for inner city kids, and they bombed on those tests because the vocabulary was so different. I understand the issues. I don't understand them deeply. In other words, I, I don't work within that children's education field, but I understand the issue. I even understand the point these guys are making. But the, <laughs> you are trying to get some level of uniformity in a culture. You are tr there is a reason, for example, where if you are on primetime TV or if you're a sportscaster or something like that, you don't use profanity, all right? And, and then you may have a live event that's on cable and they use it because it's a different setting and they're allowed to. So it's understood. There are certain protocol. There are, there are methods of communication. I, I, I go on further. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, how about a lecture from this professor creating anti-racist Writing assessment ecologies in writing courses. Okay, let's let's move over to, to math. Let's move over to math. August 9th, 2020. So just a couple of days ago. Campus reform announced that math professors and academics at top universities, including Harvard and the University of Illinois, discussed the Eurocentric roots of American mathematics on Twitter. They asserted that the statement two plus two equals four is rooted in Western definitions of mathematics. So Ben Zeisloff reports Lori Rubel, who teaches math education at Brooklyn College, says that the idea of math being cultural neutral, cultural neutral is a myth. That asking whether two plus two equals four reeks of white supremacist patriarchy. Oh, but of course, obviously. And hey, I was always good at math. Talk about white supremacy, right? Oh, and Jewish white supremacy on top of it. So here's her tweet. Along with the, of course, math is neutral, two plus two equals four trope, are the related and creepy, math is pure, and protect math. So these are quotes. So math is pure, protect math. It's creepy. Reeks of white supremacist patriarchy. Oh, yeah, protect math, reeks of white supremacist patriarchy. 
She said, I'd rather think on nurturing people and protecting the planet with math in service of them goals. Oh, did she intentionally support grammar to prove a point? She added, the idea that math or data is culturally neutral in any way objective is a myth. I'm ready to move on with that understanding. Who's coming with me? I mean, to me, this stuff is is as simple as two plus two equals four. But, however, that's not racist to even say it. All right, now let's step back from this for a moment. There are arguments that the way data is used and processed in America puts certain people at disadvantage. Could be. That's possible. But that does not. So you look into those issues. I'm always open-minded to look into issues. And when people say there's more going on than there is, I'm, I'm open-minded to look into that. But come on. To, to say that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is not simple, objective truth. To say it reeks of white supremacy, uh, to me that, that reeks of a social madness that that reeks of a massive educational philosophy of deconstructing truth. And friends, this is what universities have been about for years. And we need more and more universities that teach facts and history and truth. History is taught now. Geography is taught. How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? And then here, decades ago, decades ago, there was something called feminist geography. I remember reading about this years ago. So in my article, I talk about it. Feminist geography emerged in the 1970s when members of the women's movement called on academia to include women as both producers and subjects of academic work. Feminist geographers aim to incorporate positions of race, class, ability, and sexuality into the study of geography. So how do you do that? You're looking at the topography of, of Greenland or the, the size of Iceland or the borders of Mexico and the how how do you incorporate positions of race, class, ability, and sexuality in the study of geography? So the Wikipedia article says, the discipline has been subject to several controversies. So instead of the so-called three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, today the three R's would rather be described as revisionist, radical, and ridiculous. It's as simple as A, B, C. There you have it. Call me what names you want. I remember teaching a class on Messianic prophecy many years ago, and there was an Orthodox Jewish man from Israel who had recently come to faith in Jesus. He didn't speak much English. We had to rely on my Hebrew to communicate with him. But I remember as he was in the class, he was reading through the Hebrew scriptures as I was teaching, and every so often he would raise his hand and, and, and he would look at a passage and, and he'd point to it and say in Hebrew, Ani Hashem Shezer al Yeshua. Or say Yeshua, I, I think this is about Jesus, or this is Jesus. And I look at the verse and thought, whoa, I never saw Jesus in that verse, but it seemed he saw Jesus everywhere. Uh, the question is, is the whole Bible all about Jesus? Is he in every book of the Bible? Uh, is every parable or lesson or, or historical fact, does it somehow point to him? Well, well let, let's sort that out, recognizing that ultimately the goal of the Scripture The focus is to glorify God through Jesus, that the ultimate goal is to point to Jesus. In that sense, it's all about Jesus. But but look at what Peter said in Acts, the third chapter, as he's preaching to a Jewish audience and all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. We read in Revelation 19 that the, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So on the one hand, The prophetic witness, the prophetic scriptures are ultimately pointing to Jesus. And the great lessons of scripture are ultimately pointing to Jesus. And and they are bringing the whole gospel message. Our failure, our sin, the history of Israel lays that out. And how we need a savior, how we fall short under the law. The whole atonement system, blood sacrifice points to him. King David is a type and foreshadowing of the one who is to come. Moses, in certain ways, foreshadows Jesus. Joseph in the Old Testament. Isaac, when he's almost sacrificed, these things are foreshadowings of Jesus. There's much that's foreshadowing and pointing towards him. On the other hand, 
When you read the book of Proverbs, it's, it's filled with practical wisdom. It's not preaching the gospel in every verse. Not every verse, not every passage is preaching the gospel. When you read some of the Psalms and, and it's just praise to God the Creator, it's not specifically preaching the gospel. Or when God's judging a foreign nation in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, that's not specifically preaching the gospel. So on the one hand, it's wrong to say that everything in the Bible is all about Jesus. On the other hand, it's right to say that the whole purpose and thrust of the Word of God, look at it just like this triangle pointing towards the top. Jesus is the goal. Jesus is the focal point that we may know Him and through knowing Him, give glory to the Father. Hey friends, join me on my website. So many more resources waiting there for you. AskDrBrown.org It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, friends, we're going to have an edifying, encouraging conversation, one that will really glorify the Lord, one that will bless you, one that will strengthen you. Uh, over the years, I've had the great joy of getting to know Tom Gilson. He has been involved in campus ministry. He has been a Christian strategist and thinker. He's now a senior editor with The Stream, where I normally write about five articles a week. He's the author or editor of six books. We're going to talk about his most recent book. The thing I've always appreciated about Tom is there is a Christ-like security and compassion in him, by which I mean whatever you throw his way, objection, problem, issue, there's a security with which he hears it and a caring about people first response. In other words, it's not about winning an argument, it's about helping people. So Tom's newest book, Too Good to be False, How Jesus' Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. Tom, welcome back to The Line of Fire. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. Good to be here. So Tom, before we dig into your new book, let's just talk about the importance of, of having answers for difficult questions people are asking. We're hearing about Christian leaders falling away from the faith, and many of them give reasons like the problem of evil or the church's stance on homosexuality. Many kids don't believe what their parents believed. Why do you think it's essential that the church provides solid answers for these type of questions? Well, there's internal implications. That's the biggest reason. These are... Uh, well, let me tell the story of my son, uh, since, since you brought it up, uh, something like that. His, uh, our youth pastor was sent to prison when my son was a senior in high school for uh, sexual misbehavior. Oh. A couple of years later, I asked my son, why do you still believe? And he said, because the things he taught are still true. He knew he had reasons to believe. Of course, he was raised with an apologist in the home uh, as a dad. He knew that it was still true, and he didn't fall away. And it is still true, even if people make mistakes, even big ones. So the truth was secure enough, deep enough in his heart. He knew it wasn't just, I had an experience, and, and i got to mm -hmm. kind of shut my mind off, that you had talked with your son about the issues over the years. And, and you've, written, you've written articles about this. You're going through major questions that come up. You've written a book uh, that I endorse with questions that uh, kids ask about homosexuality and having these conversations. So, so you must, on a regular basis, hear from people that are struggling, or my son no longer believes, or my daughter doesn't believe, or what do I tell my kid in college? You must run into this all the time. Yeah, it's mostly online, because like a lot of Christians, most of my personal relationships are with other Christians, but it is also with Christians. Um, marriage is falling apart. And, um, you know, there's a lot of pain in people's lives. And, you know, part of the point of too good to be false is that it's Jesus no matter what. In other words, he's still good enough. He's still the truth. He's still worth following. There's all, all kinds of pain, but he's there for it. He's, uh, he, take heart, he said, he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I, will, I have overcome the world. All right, so let's let's get to your your newest book, 
and I know you were really excited about it, and you've got some uh, amazing yeah. endorsements about it. So what, what's the thesis of it? It's a fascinating title. What's the thesis? Yeah, the thesis is that Jesus is too good to be false. <laughs> it's a, it, it, and uh, I've had people, including some good Christian apologists, say, nah, okay, when I picked up the book, I was skeptical. I'm pretty sure you can't make that case work. Uh, and, and they've read it, and they said, okay, it works. So the first thing you want to do is not jump to the conclusion that it's something that you've heard before. This hasn't been published in 90 years or more, this uh, this, this uh, way of looking at Jesus. And it splits it into two uh, plus a third part. The, the first part is how incredibly, astonishingly amazing Jesus is. I had to, I had to tell my typewriter not to write more superlatives by, by keyboard. Um, and then the second part is that he is so good that the skeptic's explanation for where the story came from doesn't fit the story. Mm. It, it, it can't be, their explanation can't be the right explanation for how we got our Gospels. And so the other explanation is, it's true. And it's, it's not legend, it's true. All right, so we're, we're going to dig into that and think through issues with skeptics. By the way, if you would consider yourself a skeptic or, or find what Tom is saying to be uh, hard to believe, somewhat incredible, well, give us a call, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. I may take some calls before the, uh, we get to the top of the hour. But I remember many years ago reading Charles Spurgeon, and he was talking about the character of different people in the Bible. And you think of Peter, and you can describe his character. Paul, you can describe him. Jeremiah, you can describe him. Moses, you can describe him, based on what we know. But Jesus transcended any one category. That to try to yeah. describe him as, as one way or leaning this way was completely missing the larger point. So paint a picture for us. Most people listening now are believers, but I don't think we fully appreciate who Jesus really is. So go ahead with some of the superlatives. Paint a picture of this amazing okay. Savior. Yeah. Um, boy, there's so many, and that's why I took a book. But the first one that I, that I realized in, in the, the first substantive chapter in the book is about Jesus' astonishing love. And I start by imagining what it would be like to have incredible power. And, and what would you do if you were suddenly granted incredible power? Um, you know, maybe someone gave you a billion dollars and you had all this economic power. Maybe you, uh, you know, got bitten by a radioactive ant or something. And, and you had this incredible ability to do things no one else could do. Jesus had incredible power even beyond those imagining. I, you know, if I were the best person in history bar one, um, and I got a billion dollars, and I was giving it all to missions and feeding the poor and stopping sex trafficking and everything else like that, I think, you know, I might still get the, the roof repaired. I might still take my family out on a vacation. Yep. What Jesus did was he had this unbelievable power, which, by the way, always corrupts always corrupts when you have that much power to some degree, and he didn't even turn a stone into a piece of bread when he was hungry. He used his power only for others. Mm. And I can't imagine being that good. It, it actually scares me to think that I would do everything for the good of others the way he did. Uh, I, I look at that and, and I, I fall to my face and I go, God, you are beyond me. And, and God fits Jesus. I mean, this is where worship actually flows, not just from the head, but from the heart. Because when you realize how much better he is than you realize. Yeah, That's and, one. There's and, lots of them. Yeah, and, and just as you're throwing that out, the question is, how often did most of us really think about that? Probably never, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that's just one, one part of one chapter in your book. So you start off seeing Jesus through new eyes, and then part one, greater than you know. And 
Yeah. This is then divided into Jesus's astonishing love, his surpassing brilliance, his authority, his paradoxical leadership, his world-changing mission, the man who was God, Jesus' friend. So let's let's talk about his his paradoxical leadership. What's so extraordinary yeah. about that? Yeah, you know, there are leadership books written about Jesus. I haven't read them all, but I don't think they get what's really weird about Jesus as a leader. His leadership in human terms, and I've got a master's in organizational psych, I know this, his leadership in human terms never should have worked, but it did. So something else is going on to make it work. Um, Here's what I mean is you don't, can you imagine following a leader who's always right? who never learns from a mistake, who never wants your opinion unless he wants to explain how you're wrong, who never learns from experience, who it's his way or the highway. Uh, This is a picture of a a horrible person to work with. And yet people followed him gladly. And so you have to look into what was it about Jesus that made people want to follow him when they would never follow another human leader with those uh, with those traits, and and it, you know it's it's his, you know he did have the authority. He wasn't ever wrong. He didn't learn from his mistakes because he didn't make any. And somehow his incredible, overwhelming love must have gotten through to them. So these things, you know, it takes something very unusual to make up for what would normally in the literature be called horrible leadership deficits. Because by the way. You know, he started a movement that's still going 2,000 years and billions of people later. That's not a bad leadership track record. And people are willing to die for him. Yeah. Yeah. The book, Too Good to Be False, How Jesus Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. Right now, the number one new release in Christian apologetics on Amazon and the endorsers, it's like a who's who list of of senior apologists, Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel, J.P. Moreland, Eric Metaxas. Josh McDowell says this book takes a fresh look at the uniquely great character of Jesus and finds in his greatness a new and compelling case for the truth of his story and present it in the Gospels. We've got a minute before the break. How did writing this book affect you? It, It brought me into touch with Jesus like never before, and I am worshiping him and in love with him like I have never been. It's, it's actually, um, it's making me easier to walk with him. It's enlivening my prayer life. Uh, and I, I just love telling his story. It, it's made it more fun to tell his story. Yeah, it, it's, when you focus on him, gaze on him, Isaac Ambrose wrote a 700-page book called Looking Unto Jesus that Leonard Ravenhill used to recommend to preachers. <laughs> he said the whole book <laughs> is on those three words from Hebrews uh, 12, looking unto Jesus. But it is an oh, extraordinary yeah. thing that gazing on him, really understanding, when, when I wrote a book recently that focused on the resurrection, I was, I was blown away even more by the reality of the resurrection, having focused on it. All right, we'll be back mm. with Tom Gilson. I, I want to take up the, the question of the Skeptics Challenge, and how this has responded to the new book, Too Good to Be False. Fascinating title. How Jesus' incomparable character reveals his reality. Yeah, last part of the book, part three, Jesus, no matter what, epilogue for pastors, teachers, other ministers, study guide, practical, as always, with Tom. We'll be right back. So what about the black Hebrew Israelites, or as they sometimes call themselves, the Hebrew Israelites? Are they a dangerous cult? Oh, yes, absolutely. You might have some who are very mild in their views, who simply believe that as blacks, that they are the original descendants of Israel, and they preach salvation through Jesus like anyone else. Okay, that's fine. But the ones that you find on the street corners, the ones that you find aggressively putting forth their message, they are full of hostility. They are full of hatred. They are bigoted. They are Jew haters. In other words, someone like me, they claim that we are the manifestation of Satan, that the white man is the manifestation of Satan. Many of them do not preach the Jesus of the scripture in any real respect. They preach a cult figure, Yeshua, or whatever name they give to him. And they would say that basically all blacks are the original descendants of Israel. So are there 
black Jews. Yes, absolutely. Like there are white Jews. Are there black Israelites? Yes, just like there are white Israelites. But are all blacks the descendants of the people of Israel? No, of course not. Categorically not. That is not so. That's part of their false teaching. Many of them are thoroughly legalistic in their teaching and then add in other customs. They are a cult. They are dangerous. They're spreading. Here's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. He had this concern. He said this, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. There is something happening now with the Hebrew Israelites, with the black Hebrew Israelites, especially in inner cities, especially in different uh, African-American communities in America, where they are gaining more and more following. But because they bring people into bondage, not freedom, because they practice hate and promote hate rather than love, because they preach another Jesus, when we bring the real message of truth and liberty and salvation through the Messiah, not through a white Jesus, but through the biblical Messiah, they'll find liberty and theologian Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I'm speaking with my friend and colleague, Tom Gilson. You can read him regularly at the stream, stream stream.org, practical, excellent, edifying, insightful articles. His new book, Too Good to be False, looking at the character of Jesus. So, Tom, obviously, many skeptics who question the veracity of what's written in the Gospels, the dependability of it, these are just later myths like the so-called apocryphal Gospels, and you have an appendix dealing with that. But how, how do the Gospel accounts demonstrate the truth of the Gospel accounts? Isn't that kind of using circular reason to, to, to prove what you've already assumed? You know, these are inspired writings, and they paint an inspired picture, and therefore they're inspired. So what's the critic's argument? How do you respond to it? Yeah, it, it's not circular reasoning, because I do go outside that for other information to draw in. And, and what it is, is the critics, the skeptics will tell you that, and, and we all agree, by the way, it's a story. And I think everyone agrees the stories come from somewhere. And you need to have some explanation for where sto- you know, for a story like this would come from, because it is an unusual story. So where and people are following it. Where did this story come from? Well, this is this is where we add some new information. Skeptics, generally speaking, and yeah, you know, there's you know variations on this. But skeptics, generally speaking, will tell you that the story started when the disciples. Um, were disappointed because there really was a Jesus and he had a following, but they were just devastated when, when he died. And, and they'd invested so much in him that, uh, and this happens in psychology, that they deal with it under cognitive dissonance theory, yeah, yeah. They, that they had to find a way to make it true. And so they did. They invented a resurrection so he could still be their Messiah. Uh, so it got off to a shaky start with something that would normally we would call this kind of crazy. And then from there, what you'll hear, Bart Ehrman talks in, I think, four books about what he calls the telephone game, where the story spread around everywhere, uh, uh, Europe, Asia Minor, North Africa, and, and the Israel region. And, and as it went, it you know, changed oral tradition from one mouth to the next. It just kept changing. And that's what he says. What happens when, when, that, when, when stories do that, they change. And so he thinks that that explains things like maybe how many, you know, the discrepancy or apparent discrepancy in how many angels there were at the tomb and so on. It changed and it developed and it morphed into the God story that we have. So that's a typical skeptical explanation for where the Gospels came from. The problem is that a backstory has to fit the story. In in the book, I talk about the the, the the novel about concert pianists, where where a living concert pianist explains that this novel is so true to what it's like. Everything from uh, being on the road to feeling the music flow out from in your fingers. Well, you open up the the book, you look at the flyleaf, and it says it was written by a pro hockey player from Calgary and his business manager. You go, nah, something, something doesn't fit here. The backstory has to fit. Well, the skeptic's backstory 
as I look at that, Art Arman says stories change. That's way too weak a word for it. They get distorted. They get corrupted. They get scrambled when they go through that kind of multicultural, multi-language, multi-everything kind of telephone game. And then they all somehow circulated back, and they landed in four places, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, quad, you know, interdependent, but four different places. And they all landed on one character, Jesus, who is decidedly not scrambled. Mm -hmm. He is perfect in multiple discernible, objectively describable aspects of his character. And it's the same Jesus, all four landing points. The, the backstory, the story scrambling backstory doesn't explain Jesus because he is perfectly integrated, one person, and, and, and unique. There were no other Jews like him, no one else like him. How did it land there if it was scrambled along the way? I don't think the, the skeptic story explains how we got the Gospels, and the only other live option on the table right now is that the Gospels are true reportage of a man who really lived. Right. So when you think through the critical theories, when you give credence to them and then try to put things together, you don't end up with this Jesus. You don't end up with this personage. And especially when people will point to alleged discrepancies between them that would indicate at the least that they didn't all sit together in the same room and say, let's make sure that we tell this all exactly the same way, because we can see right. the individuality in them. And yet what emerges is the kind of thing, you know, like someone, some famous astrophysicist once said that, astrophysicist, that the idea of just creation just happening on its own, the Big Bang on its own, is just like a, what a hurricane sweeps through a junkyard, you end up with a, a Boeing 747. It's, it's the same kind of thing, except in a literary yeah. way. Uh, what, what about, you have an appendix on this, the, the apocryphal Gospels. Aren't there other Gospels that are just as early that tell different stories about Jesus? No, they're not just as early. Uh, the, the four Gospels in, in the canon, they're all certainly first century, and there's some discussion as to what point in the first century, but the apocryphal Gospels are all at least later than 100 AD, and probably and many of them much later. And the other thing, too, is you can look at them and you go, okay, that's not the same Jesus. Yep. Uh, it, it just isn't the same Jesus, and it's almost interesting to look at them and say, okay, that doesn't look like Jesus, and you go back and look at the four, you go, oh, he really is the same character all the way through. He, has the, he exhibits the same character all the way through, and it becomes even more clear by the comparison. Yeah, and, and again, when you, when you read some of the apocryphal accounts, it's one of the first things that happens, you think, where'd they get this from? You, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the Jesus of, of the Quran is a very different Jesus, and that's because some of Muhammad's influencers and teachers got stuff from other material, later material, and then there's no evidence that these apocryphal Gospels were ever widely accepted in the early church or put together in collections with the Synoptic Gospels in, in, in regular canonical collections and things like that. So again, it's just one of these things that's raised, but when you dig deeper, it, it falls apart. Tom, last question. What are you hoping that readers will get out of this pastors, leaders, just interested Christian readers, what are you hoping they'll get out of this book? For one thing, I hope readers do it in community. There's a discussion guide in the back for people to do it in small groups. It's a, it's a fun read, actually. Gary Habermas said it this way. I hope they enjoy reading it, but I hope they really get a picture of how great Jesus is and how greatly we can trust in the truth of his story. So that, by the way, when the pressure comes, this is part three of the book, when the pressure comes, they can say, I'm still following Jesus no matter what. Yeah, and, and Tom, you know my story, coming to faith as a young Jewish man, challenged by the rabbis, challenged by professors. You, know, you kind of get thrown in the deep water and have to learn how to swim. But the more you ask the hard questions, which God doesn't mind, the more you find mm -hmm. solid answers. And we both had the same experience the unexpected deepening and confirming of faith when we're examining difficult critical issues that the the digger the digger you deep the deeper you dig <laughs> the 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 more solid the foundation you find 
Uh, so, uh, friends, mm-hmm. you can order the book on, on Amazon. You can get the ebook or the paperback. Tom Gilson, G I L S O N, too good to be false. And you could read Tom's articles every single week over at the stream, stream.org. Hey, Tom, keep up the great work and may the Lord bless the circulation of this book. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for this conversation. I enjoyed it, Michael. You bet. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember being at some meetings with Tom, some strategy meetings and things like that. And what I always appreciated was that heart for, okay, let's, let's be practical here. Let's think this through. Let's, let's look at a strategy that's actually going to help people. And then let's welcome the hard questions. Friends, a lot of people are losing their faith this, these days because the church is not creating an environment where they feel comfortable asking the hard questions. Or if they do, we're not providing the solid answers for them. And, and look, Christian apologetics are very strong today. There are many, many fine teachers from scientific subjects to theological subjects to philosophical subjects to subjects dealing with different religions and so on. There's a lot of material, and a lot of it's available for free. Yeah, uh, listen, I write books. I pour into a book so you'll get the book and get everything I can pour into in that form. But there's a ton of stuff that's available freely, You can watch on YouTube. You can go to various websites of various apologists. You can read the information. You can watch teaching videos. Then you can buy the books to go deeper or take whole courses. The information is available. Let's create an environment where people feel free, feel secure enough to be able to ask difficult questions, challenging questions. And and if we don't have the answer, our response is, that's a great question. Nobody ever asked me that before. Let's dig in. Let's let's find answers together. Let's do that. I was just talking to a Jewish man yesterday, struggling with his faith, and I said, "Hey, man, we'll we'll get you strong, but not by sticking our head in the sand. Not at all. Rather, we'll get you strong by looking at the truth." And friends, we got plenty of truth on our website. Ask Dr. Brown. A S K D R Brown dot org. Visit us there. Take advantage of the boatloads, literally thousands of hours. Free material, resources for you at Ask Dr. Brown. Back with you tomorrow.